I'd also like to add, you know, how uh, delighted I am to be part of this project and that Tao uh, invited me to, to join in, in this activity. It's really incredibly exciting to see the data coming out and the opportunities, really, for um, the computer scientists to get involved. You know, in a sense, I, I always feel we're the lucky guys, you know, the, the machine learning people. Uh, don't have all the hard work of collecting the data, they just have to start analyzing it. So uh, what I'm going to talk about, um, Tao suggested I gave a, a talk on statistical model and, and computational learning, which is part of the heading of the Pascal network that I, I've been running uh, for the past few years in, in Europe. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I just saying I thought it would be good to just give you a little bit of uh, um, a background on the kind of developments that have happened in machine learning over the last sort of uh, 10 or so years and the kind of techniques that have come out of that and I think will find, you know, will f prove useful in the, in the project. Um, I should say right away that we haven't yet applied these methods to uh, crime and policing data so I don't have the nice, you know, sort of flashy uh, pictures that we've seen this morning. Um, so just to set the scene, detecting patterns in data is, the, is what we're about. And the aim of statistical modeling and computational learning is to, is to identify stable patterns uh, from a finite sample of data. And that's the, where we are. We, we have data sets, and we want to find the patterns in them. And the aim of that is based on the detected pattern. Can we process future data more accurately, more efficiently? You know, can we predict where the where the uh, crimes will occur um, and where we would best deploy police, where we would, what are the best actions to take to change uh, perceptions of police behavior and effectiveness of police behavior. Um, the approach is useful when we're <coughs> unable to specify the precise pattern a priori. So it's actually extracting information from the sample of data that it, we need to do in order to identify uh, the pattern. So, um, and in a sense, statistical modeling and computational learning are, have slightly different aims in what they're trying to achieve. So, in statistical modeling, um, the uh, interested is in inferring the underlying structure, e.g., the you know the clusters, the some parametric model, the underpinning network. Um, and frequently, techniques involve you know setting up a prior distribution over possible structures that you might expect to occur, and then applying inference based on the observations, the data that you've collected, to estimate a posterior distribution over those possible models, and using that then to make predictions. In computational learning, um, uh, the interest is more on the ability to predict and process future data accurately. So it's not so much actually being sure that you've got the right structure necessarily precisely defined, but being sure that you're actually going to make the right choice and decision in the future. So for instance, classifying, um, predicting future outputs or, or mappings. Um, and the aim of the analysis here is to give assurances about performance on unseen data, so confidence estimates about the performance you're going to see on future data. And so what types of analysis have been looked at? I mean, the most uh, perhaps best studied is classification, so trying to uh, allocate new data into one of a number of different classes, um, for instance, document filtering into topics. Um, regression is to predict a real valued uh, uh, function value associated with a particular input, so function approximation would fit within that. Novelty detection is to try and identify anomalous or unusual uh, types of input that somehow don't conform to the pattern that has been uh, previously observed. Clearly, this could be an interesting uh, approach in terms of understanding when situations have uh, emerged that don't conform to the traditional pattern of activity in a particular area. You know, the riots would be an obvious example of that. But another more classical example is, is in uh, condition monitoring of an engine or, or some system. Uh, ranking is the idea of predicting a, a rank to a particular data item. And a recommender system is something that will attempt to do that. 
Uh, and then clustering is finding natural structure in data. And a network uh, analysis is trying to understand the interactions that, are, uh, that will persist. So these are the sort of types of uh, examples of analysis. So the, the, the sort of idea that I wanted to bring out in this talk was just the, the development of what I would call principled methods in understanding uh, these um, uh, problems. And the key theoretical question is whether the detected patterns are spurious or stable. So is it that they are there by chance, just because of the particular sample that you observe? Or are they really an indicator of the underlying process that has generated that data. So, and this is really a probabilistic or statistical question. You, you need to be able to understand whether the pattern that you've identified is actually a, a stable pattern um, and uh, is not just that uh, something. From, and you need to do that sorry, from the finite sample of data that you've given. So the question you need to, to uh, analyze is whether you've been fooled by the sample into thinking that this pattern is real when, in fact, it's just a, a chance event. So you, you, you know, this is clearly a very tricky question because, in a sense, the more patterns you look at, the more potential patterns you look at, the more the chance you have of being fooled. So the the difficulty here is to set you know, the right balance between leaving yourself enough flexibility in order to find something useful, but not so much flexibility that you find things that are not real. So there's this natural trade-off that you have to settle. And to some extent, the whole of machine learning is trying to loosen that trade-off to give you yourself greater flexibility without falling foul of the uh, possibility of being misled. Um, so we're typically trying to assess very large classes to, or infinite classes of potential patterns. And uh, we, we want to be sure that whether that finite sample behavior will, will, will persist in future, uh, future data. So for one function, this needs a sort of uh, maybe a quite simple bound on a tail of a distribution. But for a class of functions, we need to get convergence uniformly over the class. And so this is sort of, if you like, uh, equivalent to multiple hypothesis testing, but where we're talking about you know, very, very large uh, hypothesis classes. There's a further complication, and this is going to be very true in this, in this project, uh, that we're looking often at high dimensional spaces. So the uh, uh, modern applications typically throw up high dimensional data sets. And, uh, so a lot of the traditional analysis has worked based on, on low dimensional analyses. And, and that type of analysis will not, uh, will not carry across to these high dimensional situations um, with limited data. Um, also, the, the methods that have been developed, uh, so-called kernel methods, one of their approaches uh, is to introduce flexibility through precisely this method of uh, moving into high dimensional spaces. They project the data into a high dimensional feature space, which gives you extra flexibility, the flexibility that you know, allows you to find these interesting patterns um, and actually find them with just linear uh, functions in those spaces. Um, and it, through that, provides a general toolkit of methods. But uh, it also is, uh, creates this difficulty that it actually creates uh, you know, a, a, a curse of dimensionality in terms of the analysis and being able to be sure that those patterns are, are stable. So the framework that, that I, I uh, alluded to you know, that has helped to uh, bridge this gap is so-called luckiness framework. Um, it allows you to infer, as you're inferring your pattern, you also infer something about the effective dimension of that pattern, if you like. So it allows you to not only find a pattern, but also have some uh, certificate of assurance about its stability or its sort of effective complexity in the space. So you look in a very large space, but you actually can sort of from the pattern you find, say whether you think it's actually, uh, whether it's going to be stable or not. 
So the, uh, the kind of examples that uh, have been used of this uh, approach are the margin in a, in a classifier, and this is the basis of the support vector machine uh, uh, classifier, which uh, is, is quite an eff effective method uh, in this kernel family. Um, the norm of the weight vector is, is used in ridge regression. Again, this can be applied in these very large high dimensional uh, feature spaces. Sparsity of a solution is another measure of luckiness. If you can find a solution that's sparse, uh, this is actually an indicator of the, that it may, you may be working in a much simpler uh, problem than, than you've, you know, you've sort of identified. And you know, compressive sensing is, a, is an example of this type of uh, uh, you know, indicator of sparsity. Um, evidence in the Bayesian posterior, if you're using a Bayesian approach to modeling, is another example. And you know, obviously, residual in principal components analysis are very straightforward example that's been put within this same framework. So the, the, the point being here that you get a win if the distribution of examples aligns with the pattern. So this is where you're effectively getting the win. You give this very complex set of patterns, but the data, the data distribution actually helps you identify the pattern and confirm that it is, in some sense, a, a stable pattern despite the complexity of the set of hypotheses that you use. Sorry, let's just go back to that. Um, so this allows you to work with a far richer set of hypotheses. So you're actually freeing up your user to plug in much more general sets of, uh, of patterns than you might typically expect from a more traditional analysis. Uh, as I said, the, the, an example is this support vector machine, which can operate in these uh, kernel-defined very large uh, flexible feature spaces and use the margin as a measure of uh, confidence about the performance uh, of the system on new data. So other luckiness approaches are, you know, they're just large margins are just one way. Uh, sparsity of representation appears to be perhaps actually a more fundamental measure um, in the sense that uh, you can actually relate the luckiness of large margins to a through a sparsity argument. So in some sense, sparsity seems to be somehow a more fundamental, uh, if you like, measure of, of uh, uh, confidence in, in a particular uh, pattern that you found. And in some sense, this brings us back in a more generalized sense to the principle of Occam's razor that uh, a parsimonious description is, is, but the, in a more flexible way than perhaps has previously been thought, can be uh, a sort of general, generalized way of viewing uh, confidence in a particular approach. So just a little bit about kernel-based learning. Um, so I've mentioned support vector machines. So the idea is that you uh, introduce a richer set of patterns through, these, uh, through the definition of a kernel. Um, the data is projected into this uh, feature space. Um, and through that, get, it, you actually work implicitly in that feature space through the, through the kernel. I think one way of viewing this is it's a very nice way of uh, allowing the, uh, the user of the data to uh, define their prior knowledge because they can actually encode that in just a similarity function. So all that the the user has to, has to provide to the uh, machine learner, if you like, or the, the data analyzer, is a similarity function or help define a similarity function between inputs that encodes their understanding of when those inputs can be similar. So this can be applied in a very general ways. And there are a number of techniques. I'll, I'll outline some on the next slide, I think. That, that can be used to build these kernel functions that can incorporate the information provided by users. Um, so the luckiness is typically defined then in terms of some, uh, the norm of some linear function, which in the case of uh, a classifier is, is equivalent to this margin. So the, um, the algorithms can be applied to different types of data by just defining the different uh, appropriate kernels for the data items. The range of algorithms is, is continually being expanded, but you know I've mentioned rank, ranking, regression, novelty detection, and so on. Um, and 
They can also be used as statistical tests to test the null hypothesis that two samples are drawn from, from the same distribution. So a very generic way uh, and a user uh, sort of tuned way of testing, uh, a, providing a statistical test of that type. Um, and it also enables linking with uh, statistical modeling techniques. So types of kernel that you can build, structured kernels using some dynamic programming methods, um, and I won't go into any details. And we can build kernels from probabilistic models. So if we have some way of uh, building a model that from understanding of the, of the actual dynamics of the system, we can use that as a way of uh, defining this similarity measure. Um, we can use uh, kernel PCA in the kernel defined space and also tune the features to the task with things like partial least squares. Uh, kernels. Um, perhaps a good thing to emphasize is that, uh, and this I think will be very important for the project, is that this doesn't, this is very flexible in terms of different uh, data sources. So you can uh, combine through a cross modal analysis uh, data from very different uh, sources and with different representations and for instance, as a, a case study, we've looked at the case of web images and their associated text. Uh, so we've built a kernel from, say, for the images from things like wavelets or color histograms and from the text with bag of words. And then we can use some association uh, approach, like a canonical correlation analysis is one way of doing this, uh, between two different data sources. And because we're using these linear methods, and applying them in this feature space, we can actually plug and play you know, very standard statistical methods in these very general spaces. And, uh, and this produces, for instance, a content-based image retrieval system uh, just through applying these, uh, plugging these, these approaches together. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think uh, statistical modeling and computational learning aim to find patterns in data. Uh, and statistical modeling is more interested in reliability of the pattern, computational learning, and the quality of the prediction. But they both have the same fundamental aim of, of, of finding patterns in data. Um, using bounds can guide algorithm design to overcome problems with high dimensions. Uh, combined with kernels uh, allows the use of linear methods efficiently in these high dimensional spaces. And to put together, we get this sort of general toolkit which can be used for making adaptive systems for a range of applications, uh, integrating different data sources, uh, and creating analyses of different types of problems. Um, particular applications will make specific tasks, and the representations and kernels that define that uh, that are needed will create new research challenges, which you know I think will definitely meet in the in the in the problems we face in in the CPC project. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much.